Welcome. Welcome to uh, Focal Point. This is, uh, for those of you who have never been to a Focal Point, we try to have these at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, and they're shorter events. They usually last anywhere from a night to maybe three weeks. This one is only one night. It's tonight. And uh, we've got a uh, great guest speaker who's going to come speak to us in just a minute, and I'll introduce him to you. But I also wanted to tell you about uh, what's going to be happening in May. We're going to have a short six-week summer series for the men's ministry. It'll be on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We'll meet in here on Thursday nights. And this is it. It's going to be six weeks on the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to go through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And if you've never studied the Sermon on the Mount, we're all familiar with it. We all know what it is. Um, it's, it's probably one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. And, of course, Jesus spoke it, so it ought to be. Uh, but it's going to fit perfectly with what you're going to hear tonight because the Sermon on the Mount, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the most revolutionary, radical statements ever made by any man. Uh, and from the beginning to the end, Matthew 5 all the way through Matthew 7, Jesus is going to say some things that are going to rock our world if we listen to them the way they were heard by the people in his original audience. Here's, here's my contention about the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us read the Sermon on the Mount, hear the Sermon on the Mount, and we hear it with post-cross ears. In other words, this side of the cross. And so we know the end of the story. We know how it comes out. And so we read into it everything we understand. But my challenge for you when we start in May is to listen to the words of Jesus like you're a first century Jew hearing him for the first time. And if you do, the radical nature of what he's calling us to will really jump out at you. So we're going to spend six weeks all the way through the end of June studying uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So we'd love to have you come join us. It'll be on uh, Thursday nights in this room. We'll start serving burgers at 630 and we'll start teaching at 7. So uh, if you want to go, want to come, register online um, and we'd love to have you. So tonight... We have a special guest, and uh, we got the chance to hear this uh, speaker last, this last Tuesday. He spoke out at the West Campus, and uh, I think you're going to be blown away uh, by what you hear. Uh, one of the things you're going to be blown away uh, with is that the speaker is 26 years old, and um, he's, he's brighter than the combined IQ that, of most of us in the room. Um, he's... He's a bright young guy. I'm going to embarrass him. Um, But he loves the Lord, and he works for Robbie Zacharias Ministries. He is a graduate of Texas A&M. Yeah, yeah, had to get that out of your system, didn't you? Um, Man, you're so spiritual. Um, He has a degree in engineering, and uh, this part's going to blow you away. He graduated with a degree in engineering. He went and worked in the field of engineering. Then he went and got a master's degree from Oxford. And he now works for Ravi Zacharias Ministries, traveling around the world, speaking at businesses, universities, on um, the big questions of life. And um, UC Berkeley and, and uh, UT and some of the more pagan places in the, in the country. Uh, <laughs> But Daniel is a remarkable young man. I, I, the only way I got to know him was over the phone. We got to meet last Tuesday. We got to have prayer together then. We had prayer together tonight. And I can tell you this, he loves the Lord. He's a godly young man, and he has a passion for what he's going to talk about tonight. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to listen, but I also want you to be thinking about questions that you have as he's speaking. On the table, for anybody 50 and above, there are three by five index cards. And you can write questions that you have for Daniel. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. If you're under 50 and you can use your phone and you want to text, you can text to that website. And it'll go directly to a computer up here and it's going to be manned by Matt. And we'll get your questions there, and we're going to field questions. We have some great questions on Tuesday night. I know we'll have great ones tonight. And he'll field any question you've got for him. But uh, I want to invite Daniel to come up. I'm going to pray for him. And then I want you to welcome him with some warm applause. So let's pray together. Father, not yet. Gosh. I'm sorry, Daniel. It's, it's a rough crowd. 
Father, we come to you tonight, and I thank you so much for uh, these men and them coming out on uh, a Thursday night to hear this topic, uh, to listen to what Daniel has to say, but more than that, to hear what you have to say through Daniel. I pray that you would speak through him powerfully. I pray that you would give him confidence, perfect recall, um, in a in a passion for what he has to share tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit would anoint him in a special way. And Lord, help us to hear what you have to say to us. We live in a culture that is uh, deeply divided. We live in a world that is um, becoming increasingly more secular and Christianity and, and faith is being marginalized and pushed to the, the background. And Father, some of us don't know what to do. Some of us are angry about it. Some of us don't care. And I just pray that you would uh, use Daniel to show us how we are to react in a Christ-like way and be salt and light in a dark and decaying world. We love you. We thank you for Daniel, and we thank you for what you're going to do through him tonight. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now you can Amen. applaud. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. <laughs> wow. Well, I uh, appreciate that. I, um, <clears throat> it's very rare for me to get an applause in the beginning, so I hope it's the same when I leave. Um, <clears throat> but no, really, the nature of my job is I'm a full-time speaker, and like Ken said, I, I speak most often in universities and business settings. And uh, in other words, it's very rare for me to do this. It's very rare for me to speak in the context of a church, um, much less a men's Bible study of my own kin. You know, this is, this is fun. It really is a privilege. Um, and, and allow me to just say that one more time. I, I really do. I mean, I was giddy just driving over here thinking that I get to address you men um, here on this topic um, and I get to he hopefully share some thoughts that will be helpful. That's really going to be the hope of tonight. Um, I consider it a privilege. I really do. I, I know Ken is a fearless Bible teacher and has been incredible at teaching the Word of God. And um, I, I consider it a privilege. He already gave away my age. Um, and so you might be thinking, what could this 26-year-old kid possibly have to say uh, to us? And I feel that. I validate that. I get it. I, I get it, um, but I hope there's some thoughts that I can give <clears throat> tonight that might be helpful. Um, the question, the topic that we're looking at tonight is culture clash, culture at large. In other words, where are we in the culture? How did we get here? And then how do we engage with it? How do we actually do something? What do we do? Now, the ministry that I'm a part of is RZIM. It's called Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. We're a team of about 58 global speakers around the world, 15 countries, and we're called Christian apologists. Right? How many people here have heard the term apologetics? Oh my goodness, okay, so this is, yeah, this, that's great. That's, that's, uh, I don't need to really cover that then. Apologetics, yeah, comes from the Greek Transliterated from the Greek, meaning apologia, which means to give a defense for something. So vanilla ice cream is better than chocolate ice cream. Let me tell you why. When I tell you my reasons why, there's my apologetic for why. Just as I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm going to give you my reasons why Christianity makes sense. It makes sense of the head and the heart. This is my apologetic. And you also are an apologist. In fact, when Peter writes the, that famous verse in 1 Peter 3.15... Set your, parts a heart, set your hearts apart for the Lord. Be ready to give an answer, an apologetic for the hope that is in you, and do this with gentleness and respect. He's writing this as a fisherman, isn't he? He's writing this to the scattered church, the diaspora, right? In Spanish, diaspora, I don't know how to say it in English, but you know that word. The church scattered, the persecution at large. In other words, Peter's hope is that everybody in this room, the church at large across the globe, would be able to answer the question, why are you a Christian? Now, have you ever noticed when you ask somebody why they're a Christian, sometimes they respond back with how they became one? But why and how are not the same thing, are they? For a moment, put yourself in the shoes of a non-Christian. The non-Christian comes up to you and asks you, why are you a Christian? And you begin to describe a process, therefore, how you became one. What does that sound like? A bit cultish. You just described a process. I went away for a week. They took me away. Right? 
a weekend. I did this retreat, men's retreat. I heard some teachings. Somebody prayed for me. That's why I'm a Christian. Seems a bit arbitrary, too. What if you went to the, the just Zen course in the Buddhist temple? Right? Why you're a Christian and how you became one are two totally different things. And the question, why are you a Christian, is one of the most, I think, pressing and important questions for us. And as we move into this culture. Now, I don't think we really know who we are in our culture. I'm not just talking necessarily as Christians. That's another topic. We don't really know who we are as Christians. But even beyond that, the questions, like if you go to any university today, and this is part of, I guess, my job. I travel around the country speaking at different universities. You ask any average student, why, what does it mean to be human, right? One of the most basic questions of life. You are bound to get several different types of answers depending on the student or the school. In other words, there are no definitions anymore. We don't know who we are. There's a a story uh, told of two Aussies who had just gotten off a boat, and they wanted to go to one of the pubs in London. And they went into that pub, and they drank, and they drank until the early morning, and as they came out into the classic, you know, dense London fog, they're wobbling on their feet, and they see a man unknown to them. He's a highly decorative English naval officer. And one of them looks at him and says, you know, hey, mate, can you tell us where we are? And the man, the officer, rather offended, pointing at his medal, says, do you men know who I am? And one Aussie looks at the other Aussie and says, oh, gosh, now we're really in trouble. We don't know where we are, and he doesn't know who he is. (laughs) It's a reality, though. We don't know who we are. We struggle with these definitions. You think about the absolutes. You think about morality. You think about this of definitions. And I think we struggle with definitions today for one simple biblical reason. And then we're going to look into the sociological reasons. But one simple biblical reason. We were in the earliest days, the created order. And there was one restriction. Do you remember that? Only one restriction with all the possibilities. One restriction. What was it? To not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what did that mean? We say that quite quickly, but what does that mean? Don't play God. Right? Do not play God, don't be the self-referencing point of all absolutes, of all moral absolutes, of all definitions. Don't play that role. And the temptation was twofold, wasn't it? God said to them, in the day that you choose to play this role, you will die. You will actually demean yourself. You will actually know, no longer know what it means to be human. You will self-destruct, but the tempter comes along and says, no, 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 no. In that day that you do this role, you'll be as God, knowing good and evil. You, 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 you will become the the definer, the arbiter of the moral absolutes. We are living in America on some of the most unpredictable days we've ever seen. It's fascinating. What has happened? How do we engage? How do we in this pluralistic culture do apologetics? (laughs) We're all called to engage with this. Can we even? Should we just kind of retreat perhaps? Regardless of how bleak our time is or our culture is or how dark it may seem, our time is now, isn't it? You're breathing, right? It is our time. And in fact, I would agree with most of my team, and all my team. It's one of the most open times we've ever seen because of the confusion that's around what it means to be human, what, who God is, all the big questions of life. There's a massive amount of confusion, but it's also one of the most difficult times to actually give a clear and convincing answer. How do we engage this world today? 
Gosh, well, there's many things that I'd love to say, there's, and, and maybe we'll get to those things in the q and I'm going to try to pick and choose some of the most important things. That, but, before, but first we talk about how we engage. I want to talk about how we got here and where we're at. All right, so let's talk. All right, let's chat. First, I want to talk with you about modern spirituality. In other words, what is our relationship with religion today? All right? What is our relationship with religion today in our culture? Now, millennials are those who are aged around the age of 20 to 35. All right? Any millennials here today? Raise your hand. All right. Okay. I am one of those. Smack in the middle, 26. All right? Now, Pew Research has put out the data that about 40%, and this number is rising as the years go on, but about 40% of millennials are unaffiliated with any religious faith, okay? Now, you might have heard them referred to as the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, right? That's because the documents that you, you, know, you fill out, and it says, what's your religious affiliation, Christian, Islam, Jewish, and then at the bottom it says none, millennials by and large check that box, okay? 40% are unaffiliated with any religious faith. That is significantly more than any other generation in the history of America, okay? At that time of their lives, 20 to 35 years old. Now, baby boomers. How many baby boomers we got in the room? Yeah, okay, baby boomers. When you were that age, 20 to 35, it was one out of every 10 of you who would have said you were religiously unaffiliated. 10%. 10% to 40%. Right? And yet, follow me, what is fascinating is if, when millennials are asked if they pray weekly, more of them say that they pray weekly than any other generation before. And the same amount believe in God, a God, heaven, a hell, an afterlife, some type of morality, the same basic principles as what the previous generations believed in. And not only that, you do not see a massive uptake in atheism. Atheism is up about 3 to 5%. So all of this, some people talk about this loss of religion and this massive increase in atheism, but that's not the case. So then you ask, rightly, well, then what is it? <laughs> What's going on here? A loss of religious affiliation, but they pray more? They believe in the same basic principles, and they aren't atheists? What does that mean? Well, the key is the word I mentioned earlier, unaffiliated. That they're religiously unaffiliated, which means they are not officially attached to or connected to an organization or a group. So what we are seeing happen, particularly over the last 10 years, is not this large-scale disbelief in God. It's a large-scale disbelief in religious institutions. Which is why you've probably heard, or even maybe said, the famous phrase, I'm spiritual, but not religious. You go, what does that mean? What they mean is, listen, I want to acknowledge a spiritual world, or even maybe a spiritual being out there, okay? I believe that I'm more than just biology, and this whole thing called life probably has a spiritual dimension to it, but I don't want to be connected to an organization that kind of like boxes me into one way of seeing how I should be spiritual. You see the separation? Christian Smith is a sociologist who went out to figure out what is going on with the religious and spiritual lives of American millennials? He interviewed, he compiled data, he wrote a book called Soul Searching. Now, in it, he noticed the sweep of modern spirituality that is taking over our country. And he noticed the exact same trend that everyone else was noticing. We aren't anti-God. We're anti-religion. He says millennials still believe in God, by and large, or a version of God, And that even millennials believe that we're supposed to behave and be good people, not bad people. If we're good people, we feel good about ourselves. We're helping society. Now, of course, how you define good and evil is subjective, and that's frustrating. But nonetheless, try to be a good person, the millennial says. Not because we connect with God in a relationship or anything, you know, Christian like that, but because it'll make us happy just being a good person. 
But this God, this version of God, he isn't personally involved in our lives. He or she or it, it's more of a personal distant being out there for us to define or for me to define. Now, Christian Smith defines and describes this de facto dominant religion amongst millennials as moralistic, therapeutic deism. You might have heard that phrase before. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Deism being the belief that God in the beginning created everything, but then spun it into motion and took a massive step back and isn't personally involved. Pew Research asked millennials, young people today, how many of you attend a religious service on a regular basis? 18% said they do. It's interesting, Barna asked people, how do you grow your faith in America? How do you grow your faith in America? And people responded with different ideas. You pray, you read your holy book, whatever it might be, you go through hard times, etc. A whole list of things. Church didn't land in the top ten. And around eight to 10,000 churches a year close their doors in America. Now, some people would say it's because of the hypocrisy of the church. Right? The leaders are fake. They're liars. They embezzle. Their faith is useless. Why would I want to go be a part of something like that? I don't know if you've seen the movie Spotlight. Right? It's a very interesting look into the Catholic scandals that Protestantism has. We have our own issues, don't we? And hypocrisy. And that is absolutely true and a major influence as to why we don't go to church anymore. We have a leadership crisis, and hypocrisy is, is by far the new unforgivable sin. But do you know that the top two reasons that are given on why they don't go to church is number one, because I find God or my spiritual being elsewhere. And number two, church isn't relevant to me don't understand me. Now, the driving factor in both of those statements is what? Individualism. Now, individualism is a cultural framework that puts more emphasis on self than on groups, right? And so religion can't come in contact with individualism because religion involves being part of a group, something like this, right? I find the spiritual being or the image of my God that I have in my head on my own time, my own place, and I don't want anyone telling me otherwise, especially the church. I mean, isn't the church the classic example of being irrelevant to what is going on in the culture and how to connect to God? I think they've failed enough times to see that they're actually fake, right? You tracking with me? Are you following? In other words, it's not an anti-spiritual movement. We're very spiritual. It's an anti-social movement. I want God, my God, I just don't want you. I don't want to be in a group with you because you are a hassle. The sacrifice. Now you might say, listen, bro, anti-social movements, are you kidding me? I mean, don't you know how connected we are today? Do you even know how many friends I got on Facebook? Right? But we are more connected today like any other generation ever before, but we are far less communal. And on top of that, this generation is called the I-Global Citizens. And what that means is they often jump from the individual narcissistic solitary life, if I had my phone, to a global level, right? Bypassing the community level altogether. They don't have community. They don't have people who they can do life with. They don't have people who they can suffer with. And without community, people are often left weak, wide open to exploitation and isolation and danger. I was just this weekend speaking at, uh, in Seattle at a youth deal. It was for high school students. It wasn't a Christian event, um, but about 400 high school students, a, con a conglomeration, they asked me and a couple of my uh, 
colleagues to come and speak on the big questions of life and engage a full day. So we did. We were there from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. The entire day with these students answering questions, answering their biggest questions, allowing them to grill us with their questions, giving talks on certain things, breakout sessions, discussion seminars, everything. And they were free to leave anytime they wanted to during the day. Not one student left. Now, it's not because we're incredibly, you know, gifted at speaking. It's simply because we're trying to address the questions that they care about. We talked about sexuality. We talked about purpose of life, meaning. At one point, we did an open Q&A where, you know, we did this several times during the day. We did this hour-long Q&A, four of us on the stage. And there was an open Q&A where a microphone was over on the side of the, the, the room. And you could text in questions just like this, or you could come up to the mic and ask questions. And we said, we'll give preference to the people who come up to the mic, right? Because they're obviously standing there, they're live, they're going to ask the question. So sure enough, a, a kid comes up, he's about 16 years old, very unassuming, and he says, hi, my name's Michael, and I was wondering if Christianity has anything to say about depression, because depression has been something very serious in my life. And we think, oh, wow, you know, hopefully we can answer this question with sincerity and love, right? But then he begins to tell us more, and he starts to quiver, and he starts to cry. And he says, it's been so tough that actually I've, I've tried to take my life several times, even this last month, even actually yesterday. And he's crying, and he's saying this in the front, in the midst of the entire audience. Right? <clears throat> so now we're on stage thinking, okay, who's going to take this? Because whoever takes this better do, you know, <laughs> better love this kid well. So my colleague Nathan to my left he takes the question and he answers brilliantly, brilliant answer. And he, at one point, is up off of his chair looking at Michael face to face and he's telling him how much God loves him and how much God cares about him and how much God knows everything that he's going through and yet God loves him and died on the cross for him and wants to know him and love him and he is not alone in this and he's going for it and it's beautiful. And at, one, at the end, Nathan says, you know what I think we're supposed to do is I think we're supposed to pray. Now again, this is not a Christian event so it was a, it was a bit risky to do something like this. But Nathan begins to pray, and as Nathan begins to pray, you could tell this was like a sacred moment. Does that make sense? Students stood up in the audience in solidarity with Michael. Six students actually walked over and huddled around him as Nathan was praying for him. And Nathan says, amen, and everybody's hugging him and crying, and there's this real sense of a weight being lifted off. Suicide, I encounter more than anything else. My boss, Ravi Zacharias, was asked to come and speak at Passion Conference. If you know what the Passion Conference is, it's a college conference for Christian students, and it's held once a year in January in Atlanta. This last year in January, Ravi was invited to come and speak 60,000 college students from around the nation. 60,000 college students. The two most common questions that were asked for help from Christian students was number one, pornography. And number two, suicide. The first demeans the other, and the second ultimately demeans yourself. We are living today with so many people living in their solitary world of questions and shame. And you and I believe as Christians that in Jesus alone we define the answers that are correspondingly true to the questions that are asked and coherent. And also life-giving, obviously. You know, it's interesting, though. There, there's been a study going on since the 1950s. And I, I love these kinds of studies because you can see trends. And there's a study going on since the 1950s where they, were, they asked the question, how many people do you know that you could call in a crisis and they'd come running? When you pick up in that moment of a crisis and you need help, they would come running, right? That number has been drastically decreasing since the 1950s. Now, what's also interesting is the square footage of our homes have been increasing. <laughs> I don't think this is just a young people problem, in other words. I think it's an American issue. I want more space, and I don't want to be around you people. 
I don't want to have to sacrifice for you. I'll take as much as I want of you. But what's so interesting is that we're willing to live with a subjective morality. We're living to li- willing to live with this strident willingness to live with these ramifications. And perhaps you're not, but the culture at large is. And I mentioned earlier, what, what is our view of morality today, for example? You know, we saw in the fall, right? We see that you, the individual, you have to decide what is good, what is evil. You have to define you know, your own identity. You have to define what is good and evil as well. God cannot tell you and me that. And people are feeling the weight, I think, of having to define what is good and evil based on feelings that are subjective. As Nietzsche said, the famous atheist, you get rid of God, it's like lighting lanterns in the morning hours. (laughs) There is no up, there is no down. What are we doing? There is a massive apathy towards what is truth. And the church claims that this idea that Jesus is the only truth, right? We hear that all the time. John 14, 6, a verse I believe wholeheartedly. Now, on the surface, to a culture at large that doesn't give a rip about truth, doesn't mean much to them. In fact, if anything, it sounds more like hate, bigotry, exclusive, intolerant. A group of us were actually asked, Ken mentioned it, we were asked to come and speak at UC Berkeley about a month or so ago. We did 15 talks on campus in five days, so three talks a day. It was absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. We were there on the same week of the uh, feminist marches that were happening all across the country, and we happened to be in Berkeley that week, engaging with the students. It's absolutely incredible. I was talking with a student there who was adamant about truth being subjective, and this was the overwhelming opinion amongst the entire student body. You know, he said to me, truth is subjective. Right? We can't define truth. We can't know what truth is. And I said to him, are you sure about that? And he said, yes, of course. I said, do you believe that to be a true statement? And he looked at me funny and he said, I think so, yes. I said, why should I trust your statement to be true when you just said we can't know anything to be true? He said, oh gosh, I never thought about that. <laughs> Listen, we as Christians, though, we, we, we don't believe in, an, in this absolute truth because you and I got in a huddle together 800 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago and we thought about the best ideas for culture. It's not where truth comes from, is it? Truth is something external from the human, from a much more intelligent source. And our goal is to translate that for people who have themselves as their own reference points for truth. Now, you can imagine the repercussions of all of this, and we don't have time to go into all of it, but as studies show As socialization goes down and isolation increases, depression and stress increase. This is why empathy levels are at an all-time low. We meet with university presidents all the time. They tell us all the time it is impossible to have actual disagreements. It's increasingly difficult. All we experience today is if you disagree with someone, you go find the group that looks like you, thinks like you, talks like you, smells like you, right? And you get together and you lob bombs on another group that doesn't believe what you believe, never actually engaging their thoughts or engaging them or putting yourself in their shoes. That's the world we live in today. Now, why? The highest ethic in our culture today is a word called tolerance. (laughs) Most all of you just nodded your head, and you knew that. Now, that was one of the topics I spoke at UC Berkeley. Is Christianity intolerant and exclusive? Now, myself and the speaking team, we travel a lot, and Ravi as well travels around the world and speaking to businesses and governmental cabinets and universities, and we find that one thing that is fairly non-controversial is that no matter where you go in the world today, 
we are in a state of turmoil. It doesn't matter if you're in Europe, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in Africa, Asia, North America, South America, it doesn't matter where you go, we are struggling to understand what is happening, what is going on, why all of a sudden have so many things become so controversial. There was a famous case of UCL, University College of London, one of the most prestigious universities in the UK after Oxford, uh, who banned, I'm just kidding, that was a joke, who banned the Nietzsche Society because they concluded that if students were exposed to the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, it would present an existential threat to their life and fulfillment. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Nietzsche. I'm not telling people to go adopt his views, but I think we should read them. If we're going to be intellectually honest people. And here we have one of the world's leading secular universities banning a whole society that was studying a particular line of thought. At the same time, in the north of England, they banned out the handing out of Mexican sombreros at a student restaurant serving Mexican food because it was cultural appropriation and therefore akin to racism. A couple months ago, there, were, uh, there was that similar case in Ottawa where in Canada's, one of Canada's leading universities, they passed a motion banning the practice of yoga meditation on their campus. Now, I'm not a fan of yoga, never done yoga, probably is nice. I'm very inflexible, probably is not what I do. It's not something I necessarily want to defend, though. I don't really care about it, but banning the practice, why? Well, the argument was, it's an Eastern practice, but it's being practiced by white people. White people are culturally appropriating the practice. That is wrong, and therefore, you're guilty of racism. And if the university allows the practice of yoga on its campus, it's perpetuating racism, so it was banned. At Harvard University, students asked a professor and boycotted a professor who was teaching a class on criminal law and included in that class rape law. They boycotted the professor to not use the word violate, as in it is a violation of the law because it made students feel uncomfortable. So to please find a different word to use. And the more you start reading about this, the more confusing and depressing it gets. Trigger words, right? Microaggressions, the list goes on and on. What is happening? Universities are expelling students ruled on the basis that all that mattered was the person that made the complaint felt offended. At Notre Dame, no, I'm sorry, at Purdue, a student was reading a book about the Ku Klux Klan. On the cover was a picture of the Klan. A student walked by, felt offended, reported it. A student got uh, expelled and couldn't graduate. What is happening? As long as they felt genuinely offended, then an offense had been committed. We are living in a very interesting time. And we are living at a level of nervousness in the culture of what I don't think we've seen in a very, very long time. UNC, University of North Carolina, famously published a list of statements, micro-aggressive statements, which if you make, it will result in disciplinary action, <laughs> possibly expulsion. Now, micro-aggressive statements or something, in include something like this. These are, this is actually taken from the document. Quote, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Or, quote, America is a land of opportunity. Or, quote, where do you come from? All of those statements are microaggressive, microaggressions that could result in your expulsion. And now that list has been shared with the majority of public universities and we are in this place. Now, how did we end up in this place? Well, I think the seeds were sown a very long time ago. And there's a new book, New York Times seller. You can ask me the title afterwards, but the, the thesis is that baby boomers, you're the problem. But I won't say that just now. <laughs> no, Albert Camus, he said in the 1950s, he wrote, if we give too much security to a child's heart, those children will grow up demanding security from everyone else. You fast forward to P.G. James in the Wall Street Journal just last year. He says this, if from infancy we treat children as gods, they are liable to grow up to be devils. 
Isn't that interesting? What are we doing in our society right now? What are we passing on to the lives of our children? And what are we now beginning to harvest? (laughs) Now, what I think we're possibly witnessing is the ushering in of what is called a new global narrative. Okay? In other words, what is the driving narrative that allows these smaller narratives to fit in? Right? Legalization of same-sex marriage, abortion laws, bioethics, university policy, modern spirituality, anti-religion institutions, anti-social movements, right? individualism, etc. All of these are smaller narratives. Does that make sense? What is behind all of these smaller narratives that is the meta, if you will, meta-narrative of the culture, the big story that informs and influences everyone's thinking? What is that? And potentially what we are looking at now is the ushering in of a whole new cultural narrative. But what is so unique about this new meta-narrative is that it's universal. It seems to be universal. In the last year, the team and myself have had the privilege of, of sharing some of these ideas with boards of many companies in the world and various leaders and um, We have team members speaking in parliaments in their own country and uh, their respective countries and surrounding countries and literally around the world. It doesn't matter what part you go into. As soon as you begin to describe this process, they all sit there shaking their head going, I can't believe we got into this mess. How did we get into this? Maybe like a lot of you, perhaps, thinking that right now. But what is this global, this new global narrative. Well, there was some incredible work done by a group called Campbell and Manning, which, was, uh, which has now attracted a, a ton of uh, attention, a lot of interest. But what they coined was a new phrase, what they called the culture of victimhood. The culture of victimhood. Now, in the culture of victimhood, everyone describes themselves and sees themselves as a victim of something. And once you are a victim of something, the overwhelming narrative in your own life becomes everything I do and say about a certain subject is motivated out of love. But anything which you say, if you disagree with me, is only motivated by hate. So everything that I do is right because I am marginalized, because I am a victim. I am utterly self-righteous in everything that I say because everything that I say is motivated out of love. And you need to understand that. But if you want to disagree with me, the only reason you are disagreeing with me is because you hate me. This new cultural narrative is directed as well against everybody. In other words, it's non-Christians with non-Christians, non-Christians with Christians, Christians with Christians, Christians with non-Christians. Everybody is in this. Why are we finding it so difficult to speak into this culture? Why are we finding it so hard to navigate? Here's why. We are beginning a second transition of what's called a moral culture. The first major transition happened in the 18th and 19th centuries when most Western societies moved away from cultures of honor. Now, culture of honor says you have to earn your honor, therefore defend your honor on your own, right? Pistols at dawn, pistol dueling, like that idea. Any slight offense, you've got to go deal with it on your own. Defend your honor. Moving to a culture of dignity. Now, culture of dignity dignity is quite similar. It just says, listen, if you have an issue with somebody, you go resolve that on your own, but perhaps there's a more dignified way to do it instead of pistols at dawn. Does that make sense? You go do it behind closed doors, and you sacrifice your public honor for the sake of doing something in a way that's dignified. Does that make sense? Now, the two, the, something that is unique, though, and in common with a culture of honor and dignity is that we have to take our problems on for ourselves. We have that responsibility, and there's a conduct that drives how we speak and act about certain things. That make sense? But now, the culture of dignity is giving way to a new culture of victimhood, in which people are encouraged to respond to even the slightest unintentional offense, as we did in the culture of honor systems. But they don't get right on their own terms. They must appeal to help to powerful others and administrative bodies, third parties. 
You tracking with me? You following this? Right? You see, in a culture of victimhood, it works very, very differently. In a victim mentality, you need to win sympathy to yourself because you are a victim. Which means when anything goes wrong, you have to go as large and as public as you possibly can to win as much sympathy as you can for your cause. So in an honor and dignity culture where you wouldn't go really crying off to daddy or your other angry Christian friend or whatever it might be, because that's not an honorable or dignified uh, response. In a victim culture, we make third-party appeals all the time. Always asking some third party to intervene on our behalf to sort out this mess, which they think should be sorted out. And through the tears and the stories of being a victim, it justifies this drastic form of action. Which means, in victim culture, we are constantly escalating conflict and complaint. That's what drives a victimhood culture. Escalating the conflict and the complaint. The psychological studies in this area are absolutely fascinating. Clinical narcissism, okay? Clinical narcissism in our developed world has been growing at the rate of 500% over the last few years. The number of psychological disorders is huge. One of the books I was reading in prep to this message is called The Destructive Trends in Mental Health. And it says this, it says, fighting for a right all too often means claiming victim status. Ironically, the rights and equality movements victimizes one group while liberating another. What seems to be a noble, long overdue act to protecting a victim can easily turn to blame and warfare. When this happens, conflict and victimizations are perpetuated and the possibility of resolution and healing is destroyed. Now, one of the interesting things, though, as psychologists have noted in a, or have noticed in a victim culture is that in a victim culture, the victims are willing to exaggerate or even lie about things that never happened in order to win more sympathy for their cause. I think this is one of the most frightening aspects of a victimhood culture. You know, the word of the year of 2016 was post-truth. Oxford Dictionary, new word, post-truth, which literally means that facts are subservient to feelings. Fake news isn't going anywhere. It's going to continue. Where we are all defining ourselves as, as victims We are all willing to exaggerate and lie in order to get the results that we think should come about. And we're doing it very publicly. Through social media, right? None of this would be possible without the internet. Now, I have a Twitter account. I I get on it maybe once every six years, something like that. Um, I have a Facebook as well. Sometimes I get on that too. But honestly, I'm I'm waiting till all of these kind of merge. I think it's inevitable. We're going to have this one massive YouTube Facebook and Twitter are all going to come together, and there's going to be a new one web address, www.utwitface.com. It's going, to be, it's going to be quite intense. But victimhood culture is causing this downward spiral of competitive victimhood. <laughs> Young people on the right and the left are getting sucked into this vortex of grievance. And we can expect polarization of our nation to get steadily worse in the next few decades unless something happens. There's a huge challenge ahead of us. And it's causing a massive challenge for a ministry like RZIM and churches like this. And it's a massive challenge. How do we speak into a victimhood narrative that has become the dominant thing that informs us all? You just take any potential contentious debate today in our culture, transgenderism, same-sex marriage, justice issues, all of them now fall within the victimhood narrative. That's what I mean by we're ushering in a new global meta-narrative. Every contentious difficulty fits under this umbrella, which is informing everything. Now, what we do in the church (laughs) is often argue for reverse victimhood. And we look just like the culture. Oh, you're claiming to be a victim and you're discriminated by something? Well, that discrimination, discrimination is against me, and that discrimination is against me, and you get reverse, reverse discrimination, and you keep going. 
And Christians don't know what to do other than just throw up their hand and say, we're victims too. Or you sit back in apathy and you don't engage with it. Both are disobedient to Scripture, aren't they? (laughs) This has to stop somewhere. Now, for the moment, if you're over the age of 35, chances are you've been living out of an honor-dignity paradigm. You're looking at all the university students and you're saying, you're all a bunch of morons. How could you possibly think this way? Chances are, if you're under 35, especially maybe even under 25, this is the air which you breathe. It's so natural to you and you're thinking, I can't understand why people don't understand the problems that I feel that I face. And now now a global language gap, (laughs) this conceptual gap, has opened up for us. And the only reason we haven't gone into complete mayhem in the moment is because we have more people in the older generations living out of an honor, dignity paradigm. But in one generation, that will make, that will be completely different. We'll We'll have more people in the culture of victimhood paradigm. In a recent poll from Ivy League graduates, they were asked if the government should be allowed to block newspapers from reporting on issues that could cause offense to other people. And 44% of them said yes. Now that begs the question, who gets to decide what is offensive? All right. How do we engage in this culture? I'm going to believe this is challenging, but I actually believe this is extremely hopeful. <laughs> Let me give you some thoughts on how we are to engage, and I'll be done. We'll go to a QA. and a I don't know if you noticed, but everything that I've been saying, the church has exactly what the world needs. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if the church acts as the church, the church has something to offer. An unconditional and radical compassion. A hospitality from the epidemic of loneliness. A community that is authentically open to all who are seeking a truth that you can stand on externally from yourself, a savior and a king who died for them and washes away their shame. The gospel is a way out of narcissism, (laughs) a sovereign God who wipes away their fears and anxieties of an unpredictable future of terrorism. And perhaps one of the most important things that is often left unlooked that the church can offer is it can be a place again for people to come and disagree with each other and not have the fear of being reported, (laughs) but actually be respected. You'd be surprised at how honored and respected these university students feel when we do an open Q&A. So after every talk we do on a a university event, we open up for about a 30-minute Q&A, 45-minute Q&A. And students who aren't Christians, who've never been to church before, come up to us after all the talks, and they say to us, thank you for having that Q&A time. We've never felt free to ask those questions anywhere else. Not in our classes, not in our jobs, not in our homes, not at churches. It's the first bridge often for people, for students, come to know Christ. Because it respects them. It's not about answering the questions, is it? It's about answering the questioner. There's a human being behind every question that deserves respect. So number one, I think we need a visual apologetic. It's what I call a visual apologetic. And what do I mean by that is it's going to take more than just the arguments and the answers. Those are amazing things, and I studied those. There are masters in them. I love it. I, I think it's important. And I said even in the beginning, we need to know why we're Christians, right? Very important. But it's going to take more than just the arguments, and I know you know this, but it's going to take that which is visual in a visual world. Our apologetic has to be seen and lived. And with the overwhelming amount of loneliness that pervades this culture, it's going to take a faithful presence, entering into their lives, into their worlds, learning how they think, validating them as human beings. You know, we've given the next generation a very interesting hand to play. We condense complex ideas now into 30-second com- uh, you know, YouTube clips. 
The world has changed its way of learning from each other and community. A generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings. <laughs> How do we engage with a generation that listens with its eyes in front of a screen thousands of hours, but thinks with its feelings? They don't know often what true love is or intimacy. May we be that for them. A leading missiologist who I'll leave unnamed was asked the question, what is going to be the greatest apologetic for the next generation? And everybody on the edge of their seats were waiting for his answer, and he said one word, hospitality. <laughs> a word that probably wasn't, you know, going to be as vivacious and boom, you know, of an answer. In other words, it's going to cost this epidemic of loneliness. They're looking for something that is real in a sensory realm. Offer your life a genuine love, not constant judgment or advice about what they're doing wrong. Earn the right to be heard. And I think our worship, not just on a Sunday, needs to be coextensive with life. Number two, I've touched on this in this talk already, but I want to just play it out a little bit just really quickly, the idea of respect. Now, what do I mean by that? I think the church, unfortunately, oftentimes fails massively at respect. <laughs> Listen, in the culture we mentioned earlier, the highest ethic in the culture is what? Tolerance. Right? That fails. That's a miserable idea. No one actually wants to be tolerated. Listen, if I disagree with you and I came up to you and I said, I disagree with you, I tolerate you. <laughs> if you ask me, what do, you th what do I think about Ken? And I said, I tolerate him. Right? Nobody wants to be tolerated. That's such a low bar. It's so low. We are shooting way too low. Christianity doesn't operate out of tolerance, though, does it? But respect for the other person. See, all of a sudden the conversation changes if I say, hey, I disagree with you, but I respect you. Because your respect requires a sacrifice on my behalf. Tolerance doesn't. Why is respect an ethic of Christianity? Because the image of God on every human being. Do you know that the Judeo-Christian worldview is the only worldview that will give you this extraordinary credential? In other words, I have no right to take a sword in my hand and take a man and chop his head off because I will be violating the image of God. I'm fully attacking and assaulting the image of God. The vertical truth gives me the basis for the horizontal. No other worldview gives you this. They either exalt you to make you a God or cast you down to the end, the other side of the spectrum to make you nothing. The image of God. And this is why the commandment is so important. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. No matter how much you disagree with someone, we are taught by Christ to love them. And you ask any Muslim convert to Christianity, of which we've been privileged to see quite a few of those, nine out of ten chance you will hear it happened in one of two ways. Number one, a dream. Right? If you don't know that, Jesus is revealing himself like crazy in the Middle East, supernaturally in dreams. Jesus revealed himself you know, in a dream, they'll say. And number two, they will say, I watched the love of God in the life of a Christian. And I said, that's what I don't have. There are scores, friends, of worldviews that I disagree with passionately. But I'm commanded by God to love my fellow human being no matter how much I disagree with them. I'm not saying agree with them. So we've been confused with that. We think you have to agree with them to love them. No, no, no. If my Lord looked at people 
with patience at the people assaulting him and said, Father, forgive them for, when they know, for they know not what they're doing. How much more is it your call and my call to love our fellow human beings even in the face of such hostility? It is a culture of victims and violence has become absolutized and hate has become common, but neither is an option for us. Show this world what it means to recapture having a value from God, external from themselves. And number three, we need to know the uniqueness of Christianity. (laughs) What do I mean by that? We take this word perhaps for granted, and the word is grace. There's a reason why Newton wrote Amazing Grace. Do you know that the gospel stories is the only narrative in any religion who has grace and forgiveness as central and unearned? (laughs) Unearned! Take any pantheistic worldview. What is every birth? A rebirth to pay for the previous cycle. There's always a payment to be paid. It means that our lives are marked by the central tenet of the grace of God over our lives. It cost him his life as he bought us redemption and freedom forever in him. And it means the response of a Christian, as we find our lives washed with grace, it is a life of gratitude and worship to our good God. Know the uniqueness, the grace of God. Master it, be addicted to it, love it. Never let it cease to be amazing in your life. It will show this world the uniqueness of the Christian gospel. I'll end with this story. I was uh, speaking at a university called Exeter, University of Exeter in England. And I'm speaking on the topic of sex on this particular day. And I'm walking to the, camp- I'm walking to the auditorium on campus, about 10 minutes until you know, things get going. And I get a phone call. And they say, where are you? And I say, oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. They say, it's packed out. There are you know, people standing you know, in the stairways, outside, out the doors. We don't know what to do. There's windows in this auditorium, and windows were open, and students were opening up the windows to listen in. Now, we had been there all week up to this point, and we didn't have this kind of response. And they don't know who I am. It's not like they're coming to see somebody special. It's like they, they specifically came for the topic. So I come over there, and they push me on stage, and they say, go. And I opened up with something like this. Well, I guess you guys are probably here because you're wondering, what is this Christian guy about to say about sex? And they all chuckled and laughed and said, yeah, that's why we're here. I said, because you're probably, you know, used to the church being the one to tell you who and who you can't have sex with and when and when you can't have sex, right? And even if you have sex, it should be something that you don't enjoy, right? And they all chuckled and laughed and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, my goal for this next 25 minutes is to, my thesis is to try to show you that Christianity is not as crazy as you might think. My goal is not to make you become a Christian. My goal is literally to just get you to see that Christianity is not as crazy as you might think when it comes to this topic of sex. So I jumped into my topic and my title and my thesis, and I go for it. And at the end, I ended on the topic of shame. I don't know if you know this, but Christianity has a lot to say about the topic of sexual shame. And I'll speak, you know, this is essentially what I said, but on the cross, Jesus doesn't just take the sins of the world, but he actually wears our shame. He puts on the t-shirt of your shame, if you will, and he wears it to be seen no more, to offer you new life, to offer you a new identity, to be washed clean and forgiven. And I ended with a small invitation. If that's something that you want, I'd love for you to pray with me. I prayed, got off the stage, went back up for a QA and a for about 15 minutes, got off the stage, said I'll be here. A line formed all the way out the door. I'm thinking, what's going on? The first guy comes up to me. He's a captain of the boxing team. He says, hey, everything that you just said was true. My father's Muslim, my mother's Jewish, I've never heard any of this Christian stuff. What do I need to do to become a Christian? Whoa, okay, hold on a second. 
do you know what it means to become a Christian? It's not just kind of this, this flimsy idea. It's like, you know, you're saying you don't like, you, know, you don't approve, you don't like the way that you're living. You're willing to turn and now follow a new master of your life, right? Is that, is that what I'm getting? And he goes, yes, yes, that's exactly right. What do I need to become a Christian? And the first phrase that came to my mind, I don't know why, was bow the knee. <laughs> I have no idea why, but I said bow the knee. And he looked at me and he said, okay, I'm going to my dorm room, I'm going to go do that. And he walked away and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa before you go, I want to get your information. I want to follow up with you tomorrow. He said, okay. We exchanged information. Next person comes up. He says, everything you said was absolutely true. I need that grace and that forgiveness of what Christ offers. Can you pray for me? Yes. Next person, a Christian who says, I've been struggling with this. I'm having suicidal attempts because I feel so much shame. And all I'm ever told is that I'm going to hell because of this sin. And I don't know what to do about it. I'm disobeying God. I don't know what to do. But what you told me today was that there's actually freedom in Christ. I've never actually even heard that before, that he even loves me. I feel like I've totally disowned him. Can you pray for me that I'd receive freedom? I prayed for him. Amazing things happen. 26 more students receiving the newness of life in Christ. Now, there's a student in the back of the auditorium sitting in the back row and he was sitting next to a very petite young girl. And he was a massive guy, maybe six, seven, big dude. The petite girl comes up to me and says, hey, listen, this guy wants to speak with you. He won't tell me what it's about, but he says he wants to speak with you because you're the, you're the speaker. Something special about that, I guess. I say, okay, that's fine. So after the room empties and I pray with all these people, and it's an amazing time, he comes up to me and says, hey, listen, I'm not a Christian. I, saw, I just saw and witnessed what is happening kind of freaks me out, but listen, I have something I need to ask you. I don't want to become a Christian. I just need to ask you something. I said, okay, that's fine. What is it? He says, well, can we go to a coffee shop on campus? I said, sure. So we walked to a coffee shop. We sit down. I said, what's, what's going on? He begins to describe to me, well, me and my teammates, I'm the captain of the rugby team. We went and we played in a global tournament in the Philippines. We won. We won the whole thing. We got a lot of money for it. Each one of us guys went, went to a particular street in the Philippines. We slept with a hooker. I got chlamydia, came back to Exeter, slept with my girlfriend, gave her chlamydia. She has been in writhing pain in the hospital for the last two years. There's not been a day where I have not woken up, lived, and gone to sleep in utter shame. What do I do? What do I do? I said to him, well, I don't really know what to say, but did, did you hear my talk about the gospel. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I heard that stuff. I told you, I don't want to become a Christian, so please, I don't, just get me out of this pickle. Give me the advice. What do I do? How do I get out of this? And then I'll be good. I said, I understand that. I, I don't really know what else to say. And we talked for about an hour, back and forth. I'm trying to explain the gospel, trying to get him to understand. About an hour we're going. And eventually I look at him and I say, well, listen, I know we need to get going, but do you mind if I pray for you? He said, no, 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 I don't want you to pray for me. I've never prayed in my life. I've never been to church. I don't want any of that stuff. No, that, I don't want you to. I said, listen, I don't want you to walk away from here thinking that I don't believe in the power of prayer. So please, can I just pray for you? You don't have to pray. I just want to pray for you. And I think out of respect that, you know, I, I just gave up an hour of my life, he said, okay. <laughs> so I clutch onto his arms, and I start to pray for him. And I start to pray down the house, all right? I'm praying, Lord, come into this guy's life, cleanse him, wash him clean. I'm believing that God's going to do something, even I know it's going to make an awkward scene. And sure enough, I'm praying like crazy, and this guy is looking around the coffee shop going, you know, this is awkward. And I'm sensing that too. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of awkward. So I look up, and I say, man, I'm sensing that you actually do want to pray. He says, no, no, I don't want to pray. I said, what if I prayed some words that reflect your heart in the situation that you are in, and you can repeat those words after me, and you can pray. And he said, okay. So I clutch on his arms, and I pray. A very simple prayer. Sorry, thank you, please. Sorry, God, for the things that I've done. Thank you for what you have done on the cross. Giving me new life. Please come into my life. Make yourself known. And as I'm praying these words, he starts to weep and weep and weep and weep. And next thing you know, he is crying like a baby. And I say amen, and I look up, and now I'm the one looking around the coffee shop going, I didn't touch the guy. I mean, he's like, 
And I look at him and I say, man, what is going on? What's happening to you right now? What's going on? And he looks at me and he says, it's as if somebody just came to the depth of who I am and loved me. I don't know what is happening. Is this what Christianity is about? I just told you 30 minutes ago that I want to become a Christian, but I didn't know it was this. And he had done a lot of ecstasy, and he, he said you know, one of the most interesting lines post-conversion that I've ever heard. He said, I've done a lot of ecstasy, but this is way better than ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, I, I had to follow up with a why, right? I say, well, that's a very interesting response. Do you mind if I just ask you why? Why did you say that? I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, because I feel pure. I've never felt pure before. When you do drugs, it makes you feel good, but you just feel like total crud in the morning, and I feel pure for the first time in my life. And then he looked at me, and I'll never forget these words. He said, and I don't know if you can get any closer to biblical conversion than this. He says, it's as if the motives of my heart just changed. We get up, we go walk around the campus. I'm introducing him to my colleagues. He's cussing like a sailor, hasn't figured that all you know, out yet, and it's <laughs> awesome, and we love it, and we're all rejoicing and celebrating, and it's fun stuff. And then he, as we're saying goodbye, he looks at me, and he says, listen, I'll know that this is real if I wake up in the morning without shame. Listen, I do drugs. I've done drugs. You wake up in the morning, and you feel like crud. You feel, you feel the high at night. You feel good. But in the morning, you feel like shame. You feel shame. And I, I will know that I, uh, this is actually real. If I wake up in the morning right, without shame, that's all I'll know. It's a miracle. I said, okay, well, I'm anticipating getting to see you. Right? So sure enough, I'm in the middle of campus. I'm waiting for him to come. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this massive dude sprinting in between students, yelling at the top of his lungs, it's real, it's real. Christ is real. Listen, let's not play the victim card, huh? Let's roll up our sleeves, get to work. Who cares if we're getting mocked? We've got answers that they want to be given out in gentleness and respect. Our time is now. Why are the universities packed out when we go and speak? It's not because we're special. It's because they have no answers. Harvard, Princeton, Kentucky, Michigan State, UT, wherever. Kentucky, we had 7,000 students come on a Wednesday night. Michigan State, <laughs> they had us on the same night of a basketball game. And they had the record, uh, record of, of least attendance to one of the basketball games. Because so many students came to hear on what is the meaning of life. <laughs> the gospel is beautifully relevant and it's beautifully true. And it's the only hope for this world for reconciliation. We have that message. Let the world see it. Live for him. And if you're not walking in, wa in lockstep with him tonight, let this be the evening that you get right with him. If you do know him, let your light shine brightly so that people can see the glory of our Father in heaven. It's been a real honor to get to spend some time with you. May your greatest days be yet to come and seeing people know Christ. Thank you, guys. All right. Um. Okay. If you've got a card that you've got a question on, just hold it up, and uh, Matt and Jonathan will come by and pick those up from you. We've, we've got some uh, good questions here. We're going to keep you busy. Mm. Uh, let's, let's, let me right. just warn you, we probably won't get to all of them tonight, so um, if he doesn't get to your question, don't be offended. I didn't you know, cast it aside because I thought it was lousy. We will get them all answered. I'll send them Absolutely. to uh, sure. Daniel and get them to answer them. We'll put them online, but I'm just going to kind of go through these, but... Um, what have you found to be the most loving way to engage deists about exploring the God of the Bible? Sure. <clears throat> you said deist, yeah? Yeah. So deist being the belief that God is an impersonal God, but he created the earth in the beginning, right? So the classic Benjamin Franklin idea, he spun the earth into motion, took a step back, uh, clockmaker, that idea, right? And, but he's not a personal and involved God. 
Um, yeah, it's a great question, and I, I find, you know, obviously a pressing one because our, you know, this generation by and large is quite deistic in, 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 in that sense of I'll, I'll tend to believe and affirm that perhaps there is a God, but not the God of the Bible. And so one of the things that I find particularly helpful, and maybe I'll just give one piece of advice in the midst of, you know, the, the sea of it, is to actually talk about the claims, the historical claims of Christ. In other words, <clears throat> Jesus makes some extraordinary claims, doesn't he? Jesus claims that he's not the deistic God. That would make no sense. In fact, he came to this earth. He's quite personal. He's quite involved, in other words. He makes a claim that he is the theistic God himself, incarnate. Now, you know the argument, perhaps. Either this claim is ridiculous, and you and I are totally bought into something ridiculous, and we made good churches, and we made good buildings, but actually all this is just a hoax. Right? Is there a historical precedence for Jesus' claims to actually being you know, reliable and true? And I think when you look historically at the claims of Jesus and the character of Jesus himself, the person of Jesus, you find that these you know, claims that Jesus make warrant a response. In other words, you know, Jesus doesn't leave you with that option of just you know, saying he's a good teacher. You know the argument, C.S. Lewis, liar, lord, lunatic. When you look at the person of Jesus, I think um, that oftentimes uh, really shakes up the deists in a sense. Um, the, the paradigm um, that there actually can be a personal God. And when you find out that the character and the person of Christ is one not of a dictator, but actually one of you know, compassion and love and upholds his justice and his sovereignty at the same time, I think people are quite attracted to that understanding of a theistic God. Um, so I say take them to the person of, of Christ, get to know the historical claims of Jesus, um, and the, the deist will have to really wrestle with those claims. That's a great question. That's the first thing I might say, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this next one is, uh, uh, of course, our subtitle, uh, The Battle for the Soul of America. So this question is, who are we battling against for the souls of America? Right. <clears throat> Gosh, that is a very, I don't want to get too you know, sticky on that one. Um, it's easy right now for me to say, well, we're battling Satan. I could just end the question, right? Um, and I think in, in part, we, we, we must not minimize that reality, right? Um, in fact, it's, it's a major apologetic in, in the sense of how we do our apologetics. You know, apologetics died in the Western world when it became just an intellectual spar, you know, sparring activity. <laughs> apologetics, when you see it in the Testament, is oftentimes correlated with evangelism, right? Our great evangelical... Pope John Stott, Anglican, used to say evangelism and apologetics is the same side of the or different sides of the same coin. And when you see even you know Paul in the New Testament, he uses the word apologetics in a very polemic sense. It's not just being on the defense; it's also going on the offense. Apologetics is directly correlated, in other words, with spiritual warfare. Giving your reasons for why Christianity is true and rational and beautiful. Sure, you can do that in a sense of just engaging the mind philosophically. But one of the things that I admire the most of you know, my boss, Ravi, is that he takes prayer very seriously, as we all should. But you can get into this idea that um, you know, battling for the soul of America you know, I think for, for me and my team, sometimes we can buy into this idea that you know, our sociological perspective has to become better and our philosophical quandaries need to be solved quicker and you know, things of this nature. But um, I think prayer oftentimes is the work, isn't it? It is the work, not oftentimes. So apologetics isn't just about engaging just intellectual quandaries. It's about engaging the spiritual realm. And that completely shifts this idea of how we engage for the battle, you know, the soul for America. It's one on our knees. Um, and when, you, when you lighten up, when you, when you get the mind fired up for Christ, and when your mind is passionate to learn the things of God, 
you can become the most arrogant Christian and I probably don't want to hang out with you. I'll try to. If you take your heart and you let it get blown up and love the Lord and you got passion for the Lord in your heart, you can be a chicken with its head cut off. But when the head and the mind are making that connection with the fire of the Holy Spirit, if you will, that's what I think Satan and the spiritual warfare is most afraid of. A Christian that has engaged his head and his mind with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a great question. Maybe I need to think about it more, but it's a great question. Um, I, want to re- I want people to reject wrong beliefs and to become Christians. How do I reconcile this desire with my desire for true tolerance and freedom of speech slash religion? Okay. I want people to become Christians and reject wrong ideas. How do I do this in a way that is essentially upholding respect and upholding yeah. the love for them? Yeah. Freedom of speech and religion. Freedom of speech and religion. <clears throat> Here, let me be honest with you. The, the art of being a Christian today, there's an art, and that is uncompromising truth. I stand here before you as a very conservative Christian. <laughs> Biblical inerrancy. All of that. But I also don't compromise on compassion. And the struggle today for Christians is trying to find this art of how do we take someone who radically disagrees with our truth that we're not compromising on and have radical compassion and love for them. That's the art. Truth with compassion. I think our Savior showed us a pretty amazing model. It's unfortunately missed. We preach about it, but we don't really live it. You know, you, you give the example of Jesus at, you know, with a Samaritan woman. He doesn't wag his finger at her, does he? He offers her the water of life. It's very interesting. He exposes, he shows her there are issues that you're dealing with. And I'm not going to wag my finger at you and tell you you're the reason why our country is going down. But he uncompromisingly tells her, you're looking in the wrong place. Let me redirect you. Let me give you an alternative. Let me give you a solution to what your heart really wants. There's a balance, isn't there? There's an art. Um, And we are going to fail, so don't be paralyzed by that. Um, But learn that art. So one of the most freeing things that I ever did was get in in, in a conversation a couple years ago, a heated conversation actually with a transgender person at one of the events that I was speaking at. And the transgender person, you know, at the end of it all, we all kind of just threw up our hands and said, okay, well, we just disagree. And I went up to her and I said, hey, listen, would you want to come over for dinner? I'd love to get to know your, your story. I'd like to cook you dinner. And she did. And we became friends. And we disagree to this day. And I follow her on Facebook. And it hurts my heart. But she's been to my house, she knows my parents, she knows my friends, she knows that if she needs help in a time of crisis, I'll be there. And it was very freeing for me, does that make sense? To be able to actually say, I can actually express the love of Christ to somebody and radically disagree with somebody. Recapturing that, I think, is the art of being a Christian today in 2017. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Good question. Well, this one uh, will fit right into that. Uh, All right. And gets even a little bit more personal. When it comes to respect, how does a Christian parent respond to their transgender daughter who demands to be addressed as a male? Gosh. You have two minutes. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. That is a, that is a very personal topic, and I, and I hope I can deal with it in a, in a tone that 
really warrants the, this, the intensity of it. Um, no, I, I know this. I know personal people in my life who have children that are, you know, expressing this and the parents feeling in a sense of disarray. And so I, I know how personal this topic is, and I, I hope I don't make light of it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go through my mind. Um, first thing that I would say is, listen, it's very, very easy to jump right into judgment, isn't it? Jump right into, in a sense, cursing your kid um, and telling them that they're not good for anything or whatever it might be. Or they're in, living in a fantasy or whatever it might be. They're just confused. Or where did this come from? You know, things that, well, did I do this? Was I part of this? Um, I don't know the answers to those things. I'll say this. Um, the New Atlantis is a journal that's been publishing recently a lot of amazing journal entries. It's, it's not a Christian journal. It's very much a respected secular journal. And the most recent study they did was on the topic of sexuality and gender conformity. And, you know, if you're, if you're up to date, I guess, in a sense with the sexuality conversation, you know, gender and your sex are two different things, right? You're biologically something, we get that, that can be binary, but your gender is plural. It's uh, fluid. Right? You get to choose that based upon what you're feeling. And it's interesting that the New Atlantic is this study that's done by two professors at Johns Hopkins, psychologists. And the studies show overwhelmingly, and these are not Christian professors, right? The, the, the studies show overwhelmingly that oftentimes what we see with children growing up, they might have a gender fluidity. They might have the desire at some point to feel like they want to be a girl or the girl wants to be acting as a boy, things of that nature. There's a fluidity, there's a plast, plastic, plasticness, whatever, plasticity to it, right? And it's very uh, interesting, the studies look at, at that and they show, hey, listen, that actually is quite normal throughout centuries. But what's not normal is allowing the kid to decide, in a sense. Um, and the way that we do that, though, the tone in which we do that, I think is the most important. If that tone becomes abrasive, and the kid only hears abrasive, judgmental, you don't get to decide because you're a kid. You know, I think it grows into their mind that they're not capable of actually thinking for themselves and things of that nature. And it, it, gets, it gets quite confusing. Now, the studies show overwhelmingly in the New Atlantis from these two professors, the Christian perspective, right? And if you're a Christian and you, and you watch, you can go on YouTube and look at the New Atlantis sexuality. It's a five-minute clip summarizing the entire journal entry. It's very helpful. You'll finish that video clip and going, that sounds a lot like a Christianity perspective, right? The Christian perspective. Um, but just because the science might be on the Christian's perspective, on the Christian side. It doesn't warrant us to grab that journal and raise it up to our kid's face, right? I think there's a sense in which that radical love and compassion um, needs to come. And, you know, the studies uh, conclude that even though the, the gender is fluid as children, by and large, it's a recuperation. There's a coming back to the reality of their biological sex. And so in Canada, the laws are passed now that, you know, Bill C-16, that if you, you know, call a kid on the wrong gender pronoun, you can be fined. A friend of mine who lives in Montreal was at a park just last week, and he calls me up, and he says, I was at the park, and I was trying to be conversational to this wife, this mother, and her little kid, and I said, what a beautiful daughter you have. And the mother got angry and said, it's not a daughter, it's a boy. And it's clearly a, a girl. And... He freaked out. He said, they're going to come for me. Right? She knows you know, my face, but he had to escape from that situation. It's very, very awkward and very difficult what we're living in. And so does that make sense in that, that uh, gender fluidity, oftentimes what they see, the science shows, is that, sure, there might be a fluidity, but over time that gets um, corrected, that gets realigned back to their biological state. That's what the science shows. But how you react and how you deal with it 
don't care about what science says, right? Care about what the gospel says and what our Christ commands us with people who we deeply love and care about and want the best for. Um, and so it's a very massive topic. I hope I dealt with it just now in a very brief way that was somewhat helpful. Please, if you would love to, I'd love to feel that more and come up to me afterwards. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Okay, just time for a couple of more, but uh, could the entitlement culture have a lot to do with the way our religious culture is being dismantled? Say it one more time, sorry. Can I... Could the, the entitlement culture have a lot to do with the way our religious culture is being dismantled? Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow, very, very um, intuitive and deep question. And I think there's a, absolutely there's a correlation. <clears throat> entitlement culture oftentimes correlated to you get a trophy for, you know, for not with winning and things of that nature. And, you know, there's this idea that we're always entitled for, for something and kids are growing up more narcissistic than ever, things of that nature. You know what I find interesting, though? Um, and I didn't say this in the talk, and that's because um, there wasn't time, but if I read to you quotes from Time magazine or from The Atlantic or for whatever magazine or newspaper, you would think that's talking about the millennials. But there are scores of articles talking about the baby boomers, <laughs> Gen X, all the other generations the exact same way that they talk about millennials today. In other words, when you were 20, you were probably narcissistic as well. <laughs> and for some reason, we have this idea that we can just kind of jump on the millennials and blame everything on them. Now, I'm, I'm a millennial, I get it. I'm not trying to play victim, right? We need to own some things. But we don't know how to own things anymore, do we? We don't know how to take responsibility on our own. That was part of the victimhood culture. So it used to be something like this. You, know, you had statesmen and stateswomen. And when something would go wrong, statesmen would come up and say, listen, what was done to you was wrong. That was wrong. But the way that you are now acting is also wrong. It doesn't justify your action. You do your part in respecting and we will do our part in trying to make things right. You don't hear that anymore. That idea of you know, taking your own responsibility, this entitlement action, and this entitlement culture. And of course it seeped into the religious sphere. Christianity, churches at, churches at large, you see all kinds of issues, scandals, whatever it might be, of pastors not owning their responsibility. I mentioned earlier uh, this quote that was, is actually a quote of one of my um, colleagues was in a room at a boardroom and uh, he was in a room with uh, governmental leaders in the UK and sitting next to him happened to be um, the head of PR for the Queen <laughs> and he didn't think anything was going to be said that was helpful right he just kind of he didn't really care but the first words that came out of his mouth this head of PR my colleague grabbed for a piece of paper and pen to write this down, and he began to, began to, to, to describe that hypocrisy today is the new unforgivable sin. Hypocrisy is the new unforgivable sin. And what millennials and young people, by and large, what we can do today when it comes to, you know, elections or when it comes to widespread public events is we now have the access, like we've never had before, into their personal lives. And integrity is the most rare commodity today, isn't it? We don't know who to trust. We don't know who to trust. And I think when that is framed in such a way that um, integrity being a rare commodity, hypocrisy being the norm and also the outrage, unfortunately, vulnerability and authenticity is one of the most prized possessions. Um, I, think, I think that real honesty, in a sense, that's why when people actually do own their, their stuff, and, and when not, people actually look up to that, very much so today. It's very, very rare for that to happen. Um, so I tell pastors all the time, I didn't get this from myself, I heard this before, but if you want to have a congregation that's humble, Practice humility from the pulpit, right? 
It's that idea of you know, we are by nature, this entitlement culture even has pervaded into the church. And when that is you know, taken at large, the church begins to crumble and we start to break off into all kinds of different groups and arguing about tertiary issues. So I um, hope that's helpful. That's a great question as well. Well, I'm going to end with this, uh, this last one because uh, mm-hmm. it, it, uh, I think it reflects the, the depth of the, the spiritual depth of the men in our uh, men's ministry. You're 26 and think and communicate like this. What did your parents feed you? <laughs> uh, there's one. That's a great question. There's uh, one I would, in every room. I'd love to answer that. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I, 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 tell me about your parents. I'll quick. tell you about my parents, sure. Um, my father is an immigrant from Mexico. He immigrated when he was 34 years old and <clears throat> didn't know any English. Um, and he uh, met my mother um, in actually Mexico City, and she was doing a, a study abroad trip for two weeks. And they met there, and she didn't know any Spanish. And uh, they continued their relationship, and next thing you know, they got married and whatnot. But um, my father and my mother don't really speak each other's languages. My father, to this day, he's, his job has been in the oil and gas market in Latin America. And so most of his life, is he, he breathes Spanish still. Does that make sense? He goes to work, and his 9 to 5 is Spanish. So he comes home, and that's where he does English with his wife. But he's only got a little bit of Spanish down. Now, my mother... You know, growing up in America and never really learning Spanish, I never lived in Mexico, never lived in Latin America, um, studied it for two years kind of thing, has tried to learn a bit but really doesn't know it, has one of the thickest accents I've ever heard. So she doesn't really know Spanish. Now how do they communicate? I was the translator. <laughs> growing up, they missed each other all the time. I'm going to see them this weekend and they will miss each other. I'm constantly watching how they miss each other. But to be honest, and maybe I'll just end on this, one thing that I mentioned that I think I I was privileged to see was the work ethic of my father. And my father grew up in a very, very poor part of Mexico and, you know, survived off of orange peels out of trash cans and things of that nature. Came to this country with about 45 cents in his pocket, didn't know what he was doing, didn't know the language. And America afforded him that opportunity to actually get an MBA. And he started his own company, oil and gas company, and he made it (laughs) somehow. But I've seen work ethic, I've seen how he's struggled, I suppose, and seen how even in the midst of being a bit pushed to the margins at times by close friends and family because of our ethnicity at times, you know, it's quite intense. But seeing how he's handled it with integrity um, has meant a lot to me. Um, And so, yeah, I was was fed by... uh, my father, mostly, he was the cook of the house, and it was mostly all tacos. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, anyways. Hey. <laughs> Would you guys uh, stand up? Stand up. Stand up. Help the guy next to you. Um, we're going to get these questions answered. I'll, I'll get Daniel to take time between his world travels to, uh, We'd love to. Yeah. to answer them. But um, I, I want to close with this. He's talked a whole lot about millennials. If you're a millennial, millennial in the room, you probably feel like you've been smacked upside the head. Um, most of them, most of us in this room are, are a long way from having been millennials. Um, and here's the truth. This, this topic is huge, guys. Um, when we talked on the phone the first time, I, I didn't know what he looked like. I'd never talked to him before in my life, but there was an immediate connection. Um, and we share the same heart, the same passion. And here's my desire, my hope for this, that you'll walk out of here tonight ready to dialogue with other people about not only what you believe, but what they believe. I think we've become way too polarized in America. Uh, We become way too polarized in the church. Here's what I know about our church, and I love our church. There's not enough dialogue going on between millennials and non-millennials. And there's no place for them to ask the questions they want to ask, that they're dying to ask. 
And you're the person they ought to be able to talk to about those questions. Questions about life, questions about failure, questions about being, what does it take to be a dad? How do you balance work and your faith? But see, in our culture, the Christian culture today, I think we've made it so that nobody feels free to raise these kind of questions. And I told the guys on Tuesday night, every question that he's raised tonight has gone through your head. And you may have never asked it to anybody. And you're struggling with, why do I believe what I believe? And you're scared to death that somebody's going to come up to you and not ask you, how did you get saved? Or how did you become a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? And you don't have an answer. And, and one of the things we're going to get Daniel to do is give us a list of resources, websites, books that we can recommend to you guys so that you can begin to read up so that you can know why you believe what you believe and you can begin to share it with others, lost and saved. Because there are a lot of saved people who don't know why they believe what they believe. So keep praying for him. He travels a lot. Uh, and pray for us as a church and you as men that we would really stand up and be the salt and light God's called us to be. Mm -hmm. Let me pray for us. Father, mm -hmm. thank you so much for these men. Thank you for the willingness to come. We got our work cut out for us, Father. But we serve a mighty God, a powerful God. And one of the things I'm encouraged with every day is that my God is in complete control. Mm -hmm. And you're not up in heaven wringing your hands. You're mm -hmm. not caught off guard. Um, you're not shocked. You're not mm -hmm. angry. You're not vindictive. Mm -hmm. You are loving. You're gracious. Mm -hmm. You're kind. You will deal with sin, both in our lives and the lives of those who are lost. But, Father, mm -hmm. first and foremost, you want the lost world to know about your son. And we're the voice that you've placed in this world. Help us to live what we say we believe. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that he, he has challenged us to show respect to others. Father, it is so easy to, to just make enemies out of everybody who doesn't agree with us. Mm -hmm. And we see it on Facebook. We see it on Twitter. We light people up. We polarize them. We attack them. We demonize them. Father, help us to learn how to love them with the love of Christ, not agree with them, mm -hmm. not tolerate them, but love them as Christ loved us. Because Father, all of us were in the same boat at one time. Mm -hmm. We too were lost, mm -hmm. but now we're saved. And I just pray, Father, that we would develop the grace, the mercy, the love, the forgiveness that we've received from you and share it with the world around us. Be with Daniel, go with him, protect him, guide him, direct him. I pray that his ministry and that of Ravi and the rest of the team would blossom over these next years because we do live in an ideal time and the world is looking for answers and we have that answer. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Thank you guys. Thank you, gentlemen.